it was a carefree, carefree way of life. We, we lived in bathing suits. Oh, it was just, you know, life was just very simple. That television program, Happy Days. <laughs> That's what they were, Happy Days. So many things that you can do here. Uh, it's still a great place to raise a family. Blessed to be here for sure. Fort Walton Beach is an amazing place to live, work, and play. Our coastal community offers an amazing lifestyle, a place where neighbors still wave and businesses thrive. Fort Walton Beach has a rich and fascinating history, full of amazing stories, charming folklore, and heartwarming anecdotes, some of which you may not even be aware of. Our beautiful city's history holds ties to a unique Native American culture, a signer to the Declaration of Independence, stories of pirate ghosts, buried Civil War cannons, visits from Charles Lindbergh and Al Capone, and even a Hollywood touch. I'm Ryan Christen, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to take you back in time and show you how Fort Walton Beach became the amazing place it is today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the history of Fort Walton Beach, a tale of one of Florida's biggest small places. To tell the story of Fort Walton Beach, we have to go back to the beginning, way back, to a time long before many of you might think. In a very realistic sense, this relatively young city actually began thousands of years ago. The Paleolithic people are the very earliest uh, Native Americans to be in this area, and they there is evidence of them being here about 10 to 12,000 years ago. The Native Americans that made their home in the area did so for many of the same reasons people move to Fort Walton Beach today. The people who came to Florida came here as tourists themselves. They were simply following the animals that were their livelihood. When they got to the Gulf Coast area, there were lots of reasons to stay here. The Gulf of Mexico, uh, the bays, the bayous, the estuaries, the streams, the rivers were extremely rich in resources. So this was a very good place to call home. And their village was designed around a central area that served as the heart of their community. The people who built the Indian Temple Mound would have begun in this area about 800 AD. A temple mound is a specific kind of mound built in the center of the village for the leader. It would have been built for a house to be on the top of it where the leader would have lived. As the leader looked out of his house, he would have seen around him artists and markets. There were gardens. But the village around it probably would have consisted of several hundred homes. Um, people would have lived here year round. The area probably would have felt quite comfortable to us today. Archaeologists have come to understand all of this from the artifacts uncovered. Artifacts found right here in the Fort Walton Beach area. Everything in the Indian Temple Mound Museum, all of the artifacts come from this archeological site and sites within a 40 mile radius of the museum. So they're very local to the area. The artwork on them is phenomenal. So when you see these pieces, you see designs that come from the world around you. There are designs that mimic the ocean waves and uh, the horizon line and the stars. 
Some of these rare artifacts are quite unique. One of the pieces that I find the most unique to this area is a six-pointed plate. If you were to go out into the sound and take a scoop of salt water and put it in that six-point plate and sit it in the sun, in several hours you will have salt. And salt was the number one item that they were trading out of this area. Salt and Gulf Coast seashells. They're found all over the United States. The artwork found only in this area has led these natives to be identified by archaeologists with a unique name. The Fort Walton culture was a group of people right here. They specialized and developed a very unique design that went on a bowl or a dish. It very much resembles a crashing wave. Native Americans left the area hundreds of years before modern settlers arrived for reasons that are unclear to archaeologists. This area would remain uninhabited until the next chapter in Fort Walton Beach's story. A chapter that was shaped right here by this original urban center It wasn't until the Civil War that people returned to the area. 1861 marks the second chapter of Fort Walton Beach's fascinating story. When a small unit of soldiers set up on the same shoreline the Native Americans had enjoyed hundreds of years before. And that unit was the Walton Guard, locally recruited volunteer infantry from what is now the Defuniac Springs area. And their sole job was to sit here uh, and watch the sound and to make sure there wasn't a surprise attack coming from the wrong direction towards Confederate Pensacola. That wrong direction they were guarding was Santa Rosa Sound, which provided a backdoor entrance into Pensacola. This spot was chosen because Santa Rosa Sound is at its narrowest uh, out in front of us and there is convenient high ground that's already here. The prehistoric Indian mound that's currently in the middle of downtown was the best high ground to keep an eye on the water out there. The Walton Guard unit saw some light action, which prompted some strengthening of the guard's defenses, or perceived defenses. They were given two cannons to keep a watch on the sound, but they apparently never fired them. They weren't trained on them, they were just given them, and they were mounted on the shore to scare away anyone coming by. In the spring of 1862, the guard was reassigned and people once again left the area. When they were ordered out of the area, the cannons were too heavy to move, and so they left them here. They spiked the guns and buried them in the sand here downtown. Of course, a few buried cannons were not all that was left behind. They had also left behind a name for the area. The soldiers bestowed their little outpost with the title Camp Walton. Colonel Walton was actually George Walton Jr. His father, George Walton Sr., was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. To become a city, a place needs more than just a name, even if that name is tied to the Declaration of Independence. To become a city, a place needs buildings, roads, and of course, people. With the departure of the soldiers, well, Camp Walton had none of the above. In 1868, the first modern permanent resident came to the area. Like many people today, he had previously visited and vowed that one day he would return to raise a family. He had been here during the war and uh, always said that if uh, he lived through it, that he would, he would be back and here's where he would come and live. That man was John Thomas Brooks a brave pioneering spirit who, in 1868, loaded just a few provisions into a small rowboat and set out on a journey few of us could comprehend today. Uh, came here by boat, uh, rowed here uh, down the Choctaw River, uh, across Choctaw Bay, um, through here and landed down here uh, in the Fort Walton Beach area where we basically where we're sitting. Setting out to start a new life in an undeveloped area, John Thomas Brooks carried little more than some camping gear, tools to build a home, and his rifle. 
but he also brought along a single passenger. He brought his sweet wife, uh, Harriet. So just the two of them. I can only imagine what it was like when my great grandfather rode up here saying this is the spot, this is where I want to be. It had to have been beautiful. As they unloaded their little rowboat on a small sandy beach, they declared the property Brooks Landing. The first few years at Brooks Landing were tough. Temporarily living in a tent or possibly a palmetto bungalow, they made their life as they built their new cabin, learned the land, began farming, and adjusted to unanticipated wildlife encounters. And it was said that Davy Crockett killed 50 bear in his lifetime. And so my great granddad tied Davy Crockett's record, supposedly, in killing 53 black bear in the area. And today I've still got black bear in my backyard. So they're still here and plenty. And he didn't run them all. As they grew their new life together in a new area, John Thomas Brooks would have new ideas and ambitions. Ambitions that in just a few short years would become the well from which Fort Walton Beach would spring. With a population of two, it would seem Fort Walton Beach was finally on the distant horizon. Not much is known about how John and Harriet Brooks spent their early years in Camp Walton, perhaps living in a small log cabin. What is known is that over the ensuing years, they would move into a much larger house, which was needed for their 11 children. A house which would open the door to the Grand Hotel era. Uh, my great-grandfather was John Thomas Brooks, and I always want to mention my great-grandmother, <laughs> Harriet, because uh, John gets all the credit, but she raised 11 children. As the Brooks family grew, others began moving into the area. Everyone who visited fell in love with Camp Walton, and stories began to spread. One of the priests up in Crown Point, Indiana, had come down here to recover from tuberculosis. And he went back and told uh, my grandmother's family how beautiful it was down here. And the air from the Gulf of Mexico was pure. You could smell the salt in the air. John Thomas Brooks recognized an opportunity. And in 1902, he converted the family home into a 20-room hotel known as the Brooks House, the first hotel in the area. And what some may call the foundations of our tourism industry. And the story that I was told was when my grandfather got here, that the mullet were out there jumping. And he said, oh my gosh, the fishing's gonna be wonderful. They'll just jump in the boat with you down there. The Staff family moved to the area around 1907 and became the owners of Camp Walton's second grand hotel. Sure enough, they came down and the Gulf View was already in existence, the hotel. The Gulf View was a hunting lodge at that time, and so they bought it from um, a man named Smith, and they transformed it into more of a hotel for families. The final of the three grand hotels during that majestic era emerged from a wedding present. When W.C. Pryor and Sarah Frances Brooks Pryor were married, they were given a plot of land, a waterfront lot that held a unique feature. It was, you know, it's an Indian mound. Uh, not a sacred mound, but uh, maybe they grew it into the Indianola, uh, which was not only their home first, but it became a, a resort. In 1912, Camp Walton 
also opened the community's first school. A small community like this, uh, on the edge of nowhere and trying to establish itself, building a schoolhouse would have been a huge achievement and a huge deal. Building a school was more than just an expansion of the community. It was a declaration of intent. To be a town that survives, you have to be educating the next generation. And it also shows to the outside world, uh, you know, we're here, we want to grow, and because we have this school, other people should also move here. It's a progressive city with an educational system. With the Grand Hotels, a growing population, and a new schoolhouse, the residents of Camp Walton had declared they were here to stay, and they were looking towards a very bright future. The 1920s and 30s were a busy time in Camp Walton. The Grand Hotels were drawing more and more visitors into the area. And despite looking for new ways to attract vacationers, the main attractions remain the same they had been thousands of years before. The recreation lifestyle, coastal waters, and incredible fishing. My father, uh, took people on uh, fishing trips. The mullet would run by the pier for days and weeks. Everybody kind of went to the coast because tourist season was popular. It was picking up. Fishing was very popular. Even though the fishing was spectacular, families needed other activities. So the Grand Hotels began offering nightly dances and entertainment. There was a dance pavilion which is uh, where the landing is, is now. And there were dances every night. There was a bunch of bands that would come down from Atlanta and spend the summer and play at these different pavilions. And of course, nearly 100 years ago, just like today, everyone wanted to visit the beach. Although it was a little more challenging in those days. There, were, there was no way to get to the island and each hotel provided a boat to take their guests over to the island. Hardy folks that would come here in the 20s to do that, but tourism was big in the 20s. And with that big tourism came big demands. And so the early hotels got creative with the entertainment they offered, with things like ghost tours, by boat to Pirate's Cove. There were ghost tours, there were, <laughs> you know, you have to do anything to entertain the guests. <laughs> and supposedly it was uh, one of Billy Bolaze's wives and she got involved with another man and she stole all of his treasure and buried it. He was furious and he beheaded both of them. And she carries her head and her hair is sweeping her footsteps. And if you go over there, you will see sweeping motions. The kids believed every second of it. They loved it. Another area attraction was the result of an unexpected discovery. A uh, fence is being put in around the Indianola Hotel near the uh, Midden Mound that's right at the landing. They have, you know, fence post hole diggers and someone chunk, hit something metal. My grandfather hit something uh, really hard, heavy. He went yelling to everybody that he thought he had found uh, Billy Bowleg's treasure. <laughs> and it turned out to be this cannon. And they dig it up, and it was one of the tubes, one of the cannons that the Walton Guard had. The second cannon is still probably buried somewhere downtown. So someone is going to be digging a sidewalk or an irrigation system or the foundations for a new building and whoop, find the other metal cannon. And hopefully it will go on display right next to the first one here at the museum. Things were getting pretty exciting in Camp Walton. The small town got its first Ford, which often ran up and down all 200 yards of the dirt main street loaded with kids. And the small town even got its first phone. My grandfather told me they had the first telephone, but he said they didn't have anybody to telephone. There was nobody I mean, the Gulf, you had a telephone. Well, who are you going to telephone? You know, nobody in town had a telephone. If they had found anyone to call, they could have told them about the advancements 
electrifying cottages. There was no electricity here until the 30s. The power, power kind of came along the same time the highways came. So these cottages here were electrified. And, you know, Peg's great-grandfather, some of his papers we, we find, uh, he and Theo staff partnered uh, in putting in a generator and electrifying the cottages in Camp Walton in 1924-25. Life in the early days of Camp Walton was a very special time, exciting and challenging. Perhaps captured best in a letter written years later by Diana Billy Pryor Sloat, who had been the first little girl born in Camp Walton in 1910. She said, uh, and I, I, like, I like this quote, what a privilege it was to have grown up here during the early days. Let me tell you what it was like. Life was hard. We were all poor and worked very hard to earn two nickels to rub together. It was a close-knit village, and many people who came here said it was, quote, the biggest small place they had ever been in. The biggest small place they had ever been in. A description that remains as true today of modern Fort Walton Beach as the day it was written. Camp Walton was slowly turning into a thriving little town, but there were still a couple of things missing, namely bridges and roads. Traveling to and from the area required a boat, but surprisingly, with the help of the Great Depression and some aggressive politics from prominent local leaders, that problem would soon be solved. To get anywhere, you had to go by boat, and there might have been some very rough trails, but certainly not anything that could be called a road. And you had to go all the way around. There was not the Shalimar Bridge, there was not the uh, Slinkle Bow Bridge. The old wagon trail in and out of Camp Walton was tough on automobiles. In fact, it was that very reason that led Theo's staff to open the first garage. My grandfather probably bought one of the first cars in Fort Walton, and it would, must have been a Studebaker. Why else would you have a Studebaker garage? They drove down in a car, and most of the tires were flat by the time they got here, and they always had radiator heater troubles. Some cars for that early dealership were brought in by boat and often sold under unique deals. They would trade uh, a car for a cow or two cows or cow and milk for a year or something like that. Camp Walton, however, needed more than a garage and a car dealership. It needed roads and bridges for those cars. Most of the paved roads and bridges in our area were put in, first put in, in the 1930s uh, during all of the New Deal uh, work programs under President Roosevelt. But those roads and bridges didn't just show up. It took a lot of work from a few locals to literally get Camp Walton on the map. My grandfather, uh, Theo Staff, and Will Brooks were responsible for bringing Highway 98 through Fort Walton. They had to make numerous trips to Tallahassee to lobby members of the legislature. And my father, W.C. Pryor, I even had to go to Washington for permission to open the south end of the county. Camp Walton also saw the arrival of the Swing Bridge over the Narrows, or what many call the first Brooks Bridge. Everybody would go for a little ride across the bridge. And if the bells started ringing, Raw Bridge was going to open up, everybody was scared to death. What are we going to do if the bridge opens up? I had an aunt. And we'd start over the bridge and she'd start, pray, 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 pray that the bridge doesn't open and we don't just fall in the water. Can you imagine telling kids that and scaring them to death? And one time the bell started ringing, my aunt would always drive and she opens the door and jumps out of the car and the car is still running. The bridge is not opening, they're not going to open up with her on the bridge. <laughs> and just before it turned, we would hop on it just when it was separating and ride it. The, the man in the little house that took care of the bridge, 
he would have such a fit and he would, I'm going to tell your parents and everything, <laughs> but we thought that was the most exciting thing we could do and here it really was. It was also around this time that some famous personalities were rumored to have visited the area, including Charles Lindbergh, who landed his seaplane in the area for repairs with parts shipped to Buck's store. And of course, the infamous Al Capone. Al Capone, I can remember, they said we'd come here and stay, you know, when things were getting too hot for him. The big boy himself. What's the hurry, Al? Where you're going, you'll have loads of time. A group of residents also began to focus on civic improvements and started the first woman's club. And they were not a women's club. It was woman, W-O-M-A-N apostrophe S. Today, that same woman's club focuses on modern civic improvements. But in those early years, they tackled problems associated with a more rural lifestyle. Cows were free to, to roam. It caused quite a commotion uh, one night because a cow fell into the septic tank. <laughs> big projects early on was to put up cattle guards and fencing to keep the pigs and the cows from roaming into their yards. We were not a town, so they proceeded to make us a town. One prominent member of that woman's club was Lizzie Mae Jackson, more commonly known as Liza Jackson. My grandmother and Liza Jackson were extremely civic-minded. Liza Jackson also served on the town council was president of the Library and Garden Club, donated the land for St. Simon's on the Sound, a city community center, and Little League Stadium. Today, there is a school and city park named in her honor. Of course, it was not just the Women's Club making Camp Walton a town. A small group led by Dr. Beale also began to push for a more prestigious name for the area. He took offense to people thinking that we were just a little wide place in the road, that it deserved a more uh, sophisticated name. Look on this postcard here and it tells us exactly date that the, you know, 1932 on February the 29th, the leap year, is when it changed, the name changed from Camp Walton uh, to Fort Walton. No beach yet, still, had, still hadn't changed that. With paved roads, bridges, and a new name. Fort Walton was starting to grow into the modern city we know today. In the next chapter of Fort Walton's story, we'll see that growth reach new heights, thanks to some new neighbors. In 1930, the U.S. Army Air Corps, before becoming the Air Force, was tasked with coastal defense. And when it comes to training pilots for that mission, there's no better place than Northwest Florida. Recognizing what the military could bring to the area in terms of economics and development, the owner of the Valparaiso Inn, James Plew, offered nearly 1,500 acres of land to the military. And in 1935, the U.S. Army Air Corps activated the Valparaiso Bombing and Gunnery Range, which a few years later, in 1937, was named Eglin Field. The development of Eglin over the years started from the early 30s being a bombing and gunnery range to where it is today uh, as a premier research development and testing center. Over the years, Eglin Field grew quickly, especially during World War II. And it was during those years that it became obvious Eglin could offer unique solutions to train for special missions. The Doolittle Raid came right in the aftermath of, of Pearl Harbor. It gave the American people the first piece of good news that they had had. And as a morale builder, it was very effective. Over the years, Eglin would support a number of special missions. And as those special mission demands expanded, so did the Eglin complex with new auxiliary fields focused on new specialties. Herbert Field started off its life as Eg Eglin Auxiliary Field Number 9. Uh, it's been the home of air commandos uh, straight through since 1961. Through the years, Eglin and Herbert have elevated the capabilities of the U.S. Armed Forces. 
you have operational wings, you have uh, test wings, you have a lot of missions that uh, contribute uh, very mightily uh, to national security from both of these bases. The military in Northwest Florida has provided direct mission training and support for a number of daring military missions over the years. It's a very important uh, raid uh, to rescue American, uh, Americans held prisoner of war in the Vietnam era. Uh, was rehearsed on this range as well. The military in Northwest Florida also provides opportunity to build and develop skills necessary to support other major missions, such as the Osama bin Laden raid. That particular raid, the skills that were honed by the airmen and the special operators that were involved in the mission, uh, you could draw direct parallels to uh, the contributions here in Northwest Florida. The military here in Northwest Florida for many years has also played a major role in testing technology and armaments. So the MOAB is a, is a perfect uh, example of Eglin uh, developing a munition, you know, obviously as part of the Armament Center, and special operations utilization of that. With all of the cutting edge military technology right here in our backyard, it's no wonder that as early as the 1940s, Hollywood took notice. 30 seconds over Tokyo, you know, there was big portions of that were filmed uh, here in the local area as, as uh, obviously a nod to the Doolittle Raid. And of course, parts of modern action movies have been filmed right here, including Transformers movies. And every uh, airframe that we had in our inventory here at Herbert Field was, uh, was portrayed in that movie. Along with bringing Hollywood to the Emerald Coast, Eglin and Herbert have brought massive economic growth and support for decades. Support that will extend in this community far into the future. The growth of mission and the importance of the mission sets, both at Eglin and Hurlburt, are clear from the early 30s on. And uh, while the mission sets may have evolved some, uh, the importance for this area is going to remain. The importance of the Eglin uh, Test and Training Complex the importance of the mission sets, both of the Air Armament Center and Special Operations are, uh, are prominent. They will be cornerstones uh, for the military uh, for the foreseeable future. Today, tributes to the men and women of our armed forces are found throughout Fort Walton Beach and the surrounding area, such as the Veterans Tribute Tower. 2014 on 9-11, we're able to cast the bell dedicated to our veterans for their service, uh, for the veterans in the past and for the veterans currently and the veterans in the future. The tower was built in Ohio and escorted by Patriot Guard every foot of its journey to be proudly displayed at Beale Memorial Cemetery in Fort Walton Beach. Huge cemetery has about 1,700 veterans buried there, including Ed Horton, one of our Doolittle Raiders. In addition, the college athletic team is named to honor Colonel Doolittle and his brave men. The Northwest Florida State College Raiders honor the bold spirit of the men and women in today's Air Force, as well as those brave flyers that first came to our area in the 1930s. The military was not the only thing flying in those days for Fort Walton. Time, it would seem, was doing the same. And with their new neighbors, Fort Walton was about to enter a time of unprecedented growth. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, Fort Walton's population would rise by over 10,000 percent, from only 90 people in 1940 to over 11,000 by 1960. It was the golden era of Florida's playground area. It was just a a, a rich time to grow up here. Summertime, we'd swim every day. Uh, we would just, we'd get on our bikes and go wherever. As little kids, we could walk down Main Street. Oh, it was just, you know, life was just very simple. And the golfie was nothing but a huge playground. We just lived to be in Fort Walton. Of course, it wasn't just fun for the kids. There was a story years ago talking about this little place that had more neon than they had ever even seen in New Orleans. And gambling was legal. I can remember we had a slot machine in the front of staffs and they had a, a like a Coca-Cola crate that you could pull out and stand on if you were five years old so that you can play the slot machine. I loved the slot machines. 
and I do to this day. <laughs> Nicknamed the Little Las Vegas of Florida, Fort Walton had something for everyone. One of the most popular casinos could be found just over the swing bridge at Tower Beach, a magical place that had it all. A boardwalk, the first fishing pier, a dance pavilion, and even beachfront cottages for vacationers. There was the, the boardwalk that was out on Santa Rosa Island, and you'll see the casino and all these little cottages. We would come down each summer to Tower Beach for two weeks. We, uh, when we left, each time we'd look up and his sign say, return soon. And, and we always say, oh, we don't want to go. But we loved it, you know, it was great. <laughs> After French Brown's family moved to the area, French and Suge began dating and eventually got married. I remember my daddy saying they always wanted cottage number one. And he said this little boy that came was always hurt. He always had bandages all over. And he says, is this a little, is this a boy you want to date? And I said, yes, dad. They spent a lot of time at Tower Beach, but they also spent time at another Fort Walton landmark, the Tringus Theater. And in those days, it was well known that Mr. Tringus ran a tight ship at his theater. He did not want you to put your arm around your girl because that's what happened with French. When we were in the movies, he put his arm around me. Mr. Tringus came and said, we're not gonna have any of that. And I can tell you this, he was uh, a very strict person. <laughs> when you went in there as a kid, you better behave or he was gonna ask you to leave. Uh, but it was neat. Oh yeah, I remember watching Oh Yellow in my little league uniform and trying to wipe the tears away and hoping nobody would see me. Paying a, a quarter to see the Saturday afternoon double feature at the, at the Tringus Theater and old Mr. Tringus sitting in his little box office. By the 1950s, Florida gambling came to an end and as times changed, the little Las Vegas of Florida was no more. New governor said, the sheriff, you gotta enforce the law and so Overnight, the slot, slots were gone, the roulette was gone. With no more gambling, the city fathers decided another name change may help draw more visitors and families to the area. In 1953, Fort Walton became Fort Walton Beach. And with that final name change, the city moved into more modern times as the beautiful coastal community we know today. With another name and the 1960s approaching, the new Fort Walton Beach would begin to explore other ideas to draw families into the area. And from that, the Billy Bowlegs Pirate Festival emerged. Their goal was to bring tourists in. Organized by the JCs, the event began as a ski show festival, starting one year with a man water skiing from New Orleans to Fort Walton Beach to kick off the event. From New Orleans to here, went under the Brooks Bridge and was turning around and almost fell. And the whole thing been wiped out, <laughs> but he didn't. By the late 50s, the event had grown much larger and the ski shows came to an end to be replaced with a water parade of pirates assaulting the city. We get on board and we uh, party as we sail and then we go to the landing and make our landing and take over the city. And that's the pageantry of it all. That pageantry of pirates sailing in and taking over has also grown bigger through the years. And in the 1960s, the Air Force decided to lend a hand with some unique pyrotechnics. They'd come and they'd build a little hut out there and they'd blow it up. And uh, one year, <laughs> I guess they put too much explosives in there. They would do this paper or a cardboard fort out there. And they blew the whole island up. It was gone. When they blew it up, they blew up the island. <laughs> it's gone. It never came back. <laughs> and it blew out windows downtown. <laughs> oh, it was bad. I always thought it was the wind collapsing them, but uh, 
Some people say that there was explosives involved. I, I don't remember that part. In 1968, the Chamber of Commerce took over the organization of the event, and today it is a massive festival drawing visitors from all over. I know that when I was captain in 2007, then the, the, uh, the Coast Guard uh, counted 4,000 boats in the Sound. Sailing up to the city dock, all these pirates coming off to invade the city and taking on the mayor. It, it's, it's quite a spectacle like no other city. The Billy Bowlegs Festival has grown over time and is still enjoyed today. But it's not the only attraction born in that era that has remained. In 1955, the Gulfarium opened and presented a show like none other. It was very impressive. I'd never seen anything like that. You have to realize back then we didn't have Disney World. We are in what's called the Living Sea, and it was one of the very first parts of the Gulf area to be built, including the main dolphin habitat as well back in 1955. When the Gulf area opened and unveiled the Living Sea, it featured live scuba shows in the tanks and visitors were astounded. Oh man, when it first opened, uh, as a kid it was just amazing to go in there and see those fish and the porpoises and how they live in this big tank and who built this big tank. The other main attraction then and today is of course the dolphin shows. Train porpoises ring dinner bells and perform unbelievable stunts during regular daily shows. They engineered this unbelievable dolphin habitat for the animals that still stands today, over 60 years later. And it was built of battleship steel, of all things, out of Mobile, Alabama. Despite being heavily damaged by Hurricane Opal in 1995, the Gulfarium has endured throughout the years and remained a constant part of Fort Walton Beach. It really is remarkable when you look at the staying power of the Gulf Arium, a testament to what we do in our drive and our mission here, caring for animals and bringing that educational and conservation message to our guests. The Gulf Arium is not the only attraction that has endured. Fort Walton Beach is also home to the country's longest continuously operating Goofy Golf, a landmark Fort Walton Beach attraction. That would survive because it's it's the same goofy golf that it was. Yeah, that's the cool thing about that. I mean, it's just, it's it's vintage. Going as a kid, going on dates, uh, transitioning to taking my wife, going goofy golf. Now with my girls being excited um, and just seeing the enjoyment that they still have, that I had when I was little. As tourism picked up, the Chamber of Commerce, known then as the Playground Area Chamber, began to help promote the area and one chamber member who would later become a state representative was well known for his creative marketing. I, I credit Jerry Melvin who actually would get a bucket of sand and he would go up to a mall or something up in Montgomery or Birmingham and he would dump the sand out on the floor you know and put a couple of beach chairs there you know and he knew how to do marketing and so what was this area was was somebody with a beach ball throwing the beach ball in the air it was the playground area. To help get the tourists here, the airlines also came to the playground, and by the 1960s, Southern Airways had started flying the first commercial jetliners into Fort Walton Beach. Another transportation change also came to the area. The city had outgrown the little swing bridge over the Narrows, and in 1965, the new Brooks Bridge was built. Towering over the old bridge, the new span was officially dedicated the John T. Brooks Bridge when it opened. The 1960s also brought changes throughout the country through the civil rights movement. We have been able to bring this whole issue to the uh, attention of the nation and I think to the conscience. While Fort Walton Beach had not experienced many of the issues faced in other parts of the country, there was still definite room for progress. Progress brings about changes. It hadn't been a bad place, but it hadn't been a perfect place. As the city worked towards equality, the Beulah First Baptist Church served an important role throughout the years. Beulah uh, was the second established church in Fort Walton in uh, 1930, 38. The church provided guidance, support, and a safe place. And it served, not only did it serve as a church, but it served as a school. And then uh, Bill was instrumental in getting the, um, the elementary school, which was Brook Elementary School, built next door. 
As Fort Walton Beach worked to correct years of inequality, the church continued to serve the community as it does to this day. As Fort Walton Beach moved into the remaining decades of the 20th century with high-tech jet airliners, new modern bridges, and thriving tourism, progress and growth seemed certain. Fort Walton Beach was on par to become the center of activity in Florida's panhandle. With the arrival of the 1970s, life was getting better by the day for everyone in Fort Walton Beach. Even with the arrival of disco music, the coast was more popular than ever. And it would seem the sky was the limit for this cozy little town. As the 1970s came along, Hollywood made another trip to the area. This time, filming something with a little more bite. And Schneider, I think that was his name, he used to come in. My mom used to make cakes for the restaurant and he would come in just about every night for a piece of her cake. The 1970s and 80s also saw an explosion of the beach lifestyle. We would do whatever we could. We would take taxi cabs to the beach. Um, you know, we hung out on Okaloosa Island at the old Blue Horizon. A um, little bit of surfing, water skiing, wakeboarding, you know, whatever we could do to get on the water and have a good time. New water sports emerged, like windsurfing, a predecessor to today's modern kiteboarding, parasailing, and of course, sand skiing. Before Hurricane Opal, I mean, you know, we had huge dunes out there. You know, we would go out there and, and kind of board down the, the dunes and everything. And new attractions seemed to pop up every other week. But I remember the water park that was on Oakland's Island. Uh, if I remember right, it would have had three slides that, that was there. And then it was a big deal when they put the, the big ones going into the bay. And just next door on the island, you could even visit the small amusement park and jump on the roller coaster. And of course, you couldn't mention the 80s and 90s without talking about the shopping mall experience. Santa Rosa Mall on Friday nights uh, was huge and uh, packed. That was the hangout spot. You'd go to the arcade, you'd go to the food court. Aladdin's Castle, a Diamond Gems. You know, that, that was the place to be. Um, kind of the start before you went to a football game. But all that excitement and growth couldn't last forever. While the city maintained its charm, the growth shifted a bit to the east. In the 70s, they had a nickname called City on the Move. The community was pumped and ready to say, we are moving up, we're moving up. And I think what happened is there were a city on the move until about 1980 or so, when the city on the move became Destin, which is about seven miles to the east of us. And then everything moved from the city to Destin. And just like that, the growth of Fort Walton Beach slowed down. We actually kind of plateaued with our population and even went down a little bit, I think, as late as the 2000 census. As the 1990s came along, Fort Walton Beach found itself in a new and unexpected place. We were the hub for so many years, but then when everything started shifting east, we didn't really know what to do. I moved back because my mother needed assistance. I was truly shocked. <laughs> I was truly shocked at the disrepair Fort Walton was in. As the 1990s were nearing a close, development and growth had grown motionless. Fort Walton Beach, for the first time, had to begin thinking about revitalization. They started the downtown or the Main Street organization in the mid-90s. My mom was a big part of that, uh, along with a number of other people that put a lot of energy and time into really kick-starting the rebirth and the renovation of downtown. Fort Walton Beach had known growth for so many years, the transitioning to revitalization was challenging, especially when slowed by the Great Recession as the new century began. But Fort Walton Beach is resilient and despite these challenges, it remained a wonderful place to live. Now, as we face the future, Fort Walton Beach finds itself in a position of great opportunity. 
an opportunity to renew through a combination of bold ideas and proven enterprises. Thousands of years ago, Native Americans called this home. Around 150 years ago, John Brooks landed on these shores. Today, we are a modern city, learning to balance progress and preservation. As we learn, we must remember the people, places, and stories that have shaped our present day if we want to build a better tomorrow. And as we build that tomorrow, the past becomes our best guide to show us where preservation and progress should coexist. We're located in the old Tringus Theater that was built in the 1940s. My brother and I purchased a building. We own some surrounding properties and, and really have taken an interest in the downtown. Uh, it, it's a landmark and it was, it was able to be saved and recreated and updated. Change is good, especially when you can update facilities that are caving in and, and bring back a piece of history with the original walls. It's important to us and, and we want our kids to grow up and be able to be proud of where they live and be proud of the community. And it feels good, it's fun, and we enjoy it too. The Tringus Theater is not the only building spared of demolition. Another landmark Fort Walton Beach structure has also been given new life. In 2017, the Gulfview Hotel was offered to the city as a donation. They offered to donate the building to the city. And when that proposal was brought to, to me, um, I, I, I just saw the vision. You know, we get to save the oldest building in the city. And we had two choices. Knock it down like we did everything else, or save it for the historical component that is necessary. And I could not be more pleased that the community decided, okay, let's save the last vestige of history from the turn of the century by moving the Gulfview only about 300 yards from its previous location. The old Gulfview Hotel has been masterfully restored and returned to its former grandeur to serve long into the future as the new Fort Walton Beach Welcome Center. It is gonna be spectacular and it'll be the perfect gateway into downtown Fort Walton Beach. It's important that we protect our history. And it's, a, it's such a good and meaningful thing for the city to do. Uh, because history, you can't remake history. The reason we needed to save this building because this is Fort Walton. And there is nothing better than to have our oldest building in the community welcoming everyone to the newest part of our downtown. Several other projects are bringing new life into the downtown area, beginning with the park where John Brooks landed in 1868. We're gonna centralize the stage, redo the boardwalk, sea walls, put you know a splash pad in there, new playground equipment, food truck area, you name it. Another major part of downtown is also due for an upgrade. You know, the crazy thing about bridges and such is that 1965, they told everyone, hey, it's only, it's got a 50 year life. And 50 years at that time seems like an eternity to folks. And all of a sudden those who lived here said, holy cow, that 50 years is coming fast. The 1965 Brooks Bridge has reached its lifespan. And so Fort Walton Beach will see the new, new Brooks Bridge. Now this new bridge will be a hundred year bridge. It'll have more uh, lanes, more height, more safety. In addition to the new bridge, a vision that has been discussed for many years is gaining new support. Shifting Highway 98 north of the Indian Temple Mound to allow smooth flow of traffic in a project that has become known as Around the Mound. Now we're gonna create, we're gonna let the through traffic go north of there but downtown will truly be a destination. And once that happens, I think the rest of the city will follow. These plans have become catalyst for the reemergence of an old idea, an idea reminiscent of our past, an idea woven into the fabric of the city's history. Now we have a real opportunity to direct traffic around the downtown to just allow it to become a really pedestrian friendly, family oriented place. 
So the goal now would be to convert downtown into the strolling marketplace that many other cities have and that Fort Walton Beach has desired for probably 40 years. And I think the millennials and, and the newer generation, they want to be close where they can hop on a golf cart, come downtown, watch a movie, drink a beer, bring their kids to eat, play in the park, listen to music. We're going to create that core where everybody wants to be. You're going to see revitalized downtown Fort Walton Beach without a doubt. You're going to see uh, 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 residents moving into downtown. You're going to see the stores come back here. We are returning to the idea that a community has a heart. And the heart is often what began as Main Street. As we return to the idea of being a coastal community built around an urban center, we discover an opportunity to develop the future of Fort Walton Beach around the very same area that provided such a wonderful way of life all those years ago. When looking at modern day Fort Walton Beach, an optimism found in few communities becomes apparent, an optimism gained by remembering our past. As a community, it is important that we remember our roots to honor our history as we build new bridges between past and present. As Fort Walton Beach drifts into the future, it's clear that the historic currents that have shaped our city will continue to float with the tides of change to ensure that this coastal community's charm and saltwater soul never recede. You know, once you get associated with Fort Walton Beach area for, uh, you know, it just kind of bites you. The people, I just, I just love the people. But I see what, why my sons are here. Uh, and it's because they grew up here and they understand it and they enjoy it, you know, and they're proud of it. A-plus schools, you know, we're always in the top three in, in the state of Florida. It's, it's everything. The, the climate, the water down here. The weather is just beautiful and it allows someone to do everything they want. You know, there, there was water skiing and fishing and... And I wouldn't go back to Tennessee for nothing. It has a great place in my heart. It's a great place to live, though, really. Gosh, it's one of the happiest, the happiest years of my life. It has great memories for me. It is one of the biggest small places that we've ever been. I think if it for all means gets in your blood, it stays in your blood. You know, jokingly said one time to somebody that was writing a story, he said, you know, it's a museum that serves food, and for some reason that's hung on. The part of the treasure to me is that I had a chance to be in it before it was moved, when it was in its original location, just an empty house, standing there, you know, waiting for somebody to, to rescue it. You know, when my great-granddad first pulled up here, in the rowboat. He, he homesteaded the property and then started to sell land to different individuals and then even gave some land to some families and churches just to get the community started. My office sits on some of the homesteaded property that he had and uh, I'm fourth generation real estate. We, we were in real estate before the term realtor existed. We've been around since 1954 when several people out at Eglin decided to form a credit union. And 
So our first location was actually out on Eglin, a little place called Skunk Hollow. We were in a barracks out there for a while and then built a branch out on Eglin uh, whenever Eglin started to grow and prosper and got more membership. And then in 1976, we built this building here, our main headquarters on Eglin Parkway. We actually have about 40-something military spouses that are employed by the credit union out of about 350 total people. And this building that we're at here is the Old Staff's Restaurant, uh, which originated as a Studebaker garage in the 1920s. So our aunt, Lily, uh, allowed us to put our office upstairs at the Old Staff's Restaurant. And in fact, the location that we're in up there it is still it was the original uh, radio station of all of Fort Walton Beach, and the DJ booth is our accountant's office now. All right, so GLC Contracting has always been involved in downtown Fort Walton Beach and, and rehabilitating it. Uh, one project I really like is uh, we re redid the old St. Mary's across the street. Man, it was uh, a donated funds project, so we donated, donated our time to run the project. And the church was originally built by our grandfather, Dozy. And then from there, uh, we kind of moved on to Brook Street and uh, did most of Susan Myers' projects. She had a great vision of downtown Fort Walton to what it could be. And again, we worked with her on a lot of different projects and she was just a wonderful woman. My mother was, uh, met my father at the, uh, at the Indianola. And theirs was the first, was the first uh, wedding in Camp Walton. I remember Cecil Bass worked there at the, at the staff's restaurant. And he taught me how to throw a throw net. And I got so good at that that I remember one time throwing it and I had 24 mullet in the net. But that's the only time I ever did it. <laughs> But anyway, it was great. And I remember Dosey would come by, you know, and he'd say, do you ever eat anything but hamburgers? Is that all you eat? And let me fix you a steak or some fish. And from Tennessee, we didn't have fish. And I said, no, I don't want any fish. <laughs> One time he caught me there and I wasn't doing anything. So there was a survey crew working on the road, on Ferry Road and they were cutting a line, the road didn't go to, to the yacht club, and they were cutting a line for the road. And so they put me out there in that thing. I just knew any time either alligator or snake was gonna get me. So, I mean, the next day I hid. <laughs> so, so he, those he couldn't find me in the surveyors. So. 